password. Okay, great. So that's started. Um, the second thing I wanna say before I forget, uh, for security reasons, we have you all kind of on forced mute. Um, please, no, please no one take offense. Uh, we had an unfortunate Zoom bomber at our last event and it was really disruptive. So just in the interest of keeping everyone protected, um, we have the mute function on. When we get to the Q&A, um, maybe the easiest thing will be if you put your questions in the chat. And by the way, feel free to do that during the talk. We have a very lively chat usually going on, side conversation, don't, don't hesitate. So just put your questions in the chat. We'll monitor and we'll ask uh, your question for you or unmute you um, in the order in which we receive the questions. So again, welcome everyone. Today's event is organized by the Rutgers Digital Ethnography Working Group, which is located in the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University in New Jersey, USA. Um, my name is Melissa Aronchik. Uh, I'm a professor here. I'm also the co-founder of this group, along with Dr. Jeff Lane, who's here on the call. Our steering committee for Duke also includes Professor Caitlin Petrie, Professor Joni Rivera, uh, Professor Young Rim Kim, and our graduate coordinator, Dr. Holly Avella. I'm so glad I get to say doctor. She successfully defended her dissertation yesterday on mood mediating technology. So we all have a shout out for Dr. Avella. Um, just before we get started, let me just say a word or two about our digital ethnography working group. We're a group that supports active digital ethnographers and researchers within the SKY Rutgers community. SKY stands for School of Communication and Information, but also far beyond. We aim to support and promote member output and networking. We have internal resources, regular meetings, writing groups, and of course, public events. Um, I'm gonna put our contact information into the chat if you'd like to join our mailing list or just learn more about what we do. Um, as I already mentioned about the Zoom chat, please feel free to put ongoing questions, comments, ideas, references into the chat. Uh, we'll keep track. Uh, let me cede the floor now to Caitlin to introduce our panelists. Again, thanks all for being here. Hi, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with all of you, um, to see everybody joining from all over the world. It's really um, a dream. And um, to talk about a topic that I think is of great interest to our digital ethnography working group community. Um, and so I, as we were sort of thinking about what we wanted to do events on this academic year, this semester, um, one thought that we had was that um, graduate students, um, students who are um, in the PhD process are a huge part of our, and a really, really central part of our community at Duke, at the Digital Ethnography Working Group, um, and more broadly. And so um, we really wanted to have a panel where we could sort of highlight graduate student experiences doing this work. Um, and particularly, I I think outside the context of like the polished conference presentation, you know, where all of the kind of rough edges and the messiness have been sanded away because that's the nature of a conference presentation or of a journal article, right? And really give us space to dig in um, as digital ethnographers, many of whom are navigating graduate school right now, navigating the dissertation right now, and then also faculty um, who may be mentoring students who are doing that, right? Give us space to talk about what um, digital ethnography looks like in a dissertation, what the process looks like. Um, as I wrote in the description for this event, I think any of us who have done any ethnographic research knows that there's often kind of a gap that emerges between our beautiful, exciting ambitious research plans at the start of the project, and then, of course, the research realities, right? So we always come up against certain constraints. And I think um, for dissertating graduate students who are also balancing, you know, TAing and life responsibilities and et cetera, this can be really tricky to navigate. And so um, I reached out to an amazing panel of recently graduated or soon to graduate uh, PhD students, um, now uh, one of whom is now already a doctor, um, doing digital ethnography or ha who have done digital ethnography dissertations and um, are kind of close to being at the at the end of that process to really speak candidly about 
the kind of nitty gritty, like getting into the details of what it is to do this work in the dissertation format. Um, so I'm really, really, really thrilled to have this amazing group of scholars here. I'm going to introduce them now. And then in terms of the kind of run of show for today, I'm going to um, kind of interview them myself for um, maybe 30 to 40 minutes. And then I'll open it up for the question and answer. I, um, I would guess there will be a lot of questions and a lively discussion. So I look forward to that and I'll try to leave quite a lot of time for that at the end. All right, so now to introduce our amazing panel. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Michelle Serra. So Michelle, wave if you're you're not showing up in my, but I know you're there. Um, Michelle is a doctoral candidate in the sociology department at New York University, where she studies politics, gender, inequality, and social media. She has studied and written about the pandemic and gender inequality, the ethics of digital ethnography, um, young adult dating practices, and the gendered nature of hookup culture. Her dissertation focuses on far-right extremism on social media platforms and uses a lot of digital ethnography methodology, um, as well as other types of um, qualitative methodology. Um, then we have Dr. Zoe Glatt. So Zoe is, hi Zoe. Um, Zoe is a feminist media scholar with interest in platformized creative industries and labor, social media and influencer cultures and digital ethnographic methods. Um, she is currently a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research New England, where she's working on her first book manuscript, Demonetized Inequality, Co-Option and Resistance in the Influencer Industry, um, as well as new research into the intersections of AI and the creator economy. Importantly for this group, she is also the co-founder of the Digital Ethnography Collective, um, which is co-hosting this event with us today, so yay. Um, and it's an interdisciplinary group that explores the intersections of digital culture and ethnographic methods. Um, and she's also currently in the process of setting up the Content Creators Research Network for scholars who are studying influencer industries and creator culture. I would imagine there's quite a few of those folks in this Zoom, so get hooked up with them if you haven't already. Um, and finally, we have Yana Lee. Yana is a PhD candidate in Media, Technology, and Society program at Northwestern School of Communication. Her research interweaves political communication, the sociology of social movements, and political economy of new media to study the mediated forms and processes of democratic participatory politics with a focus on relationships. She has authored publications in leading outlets and peer-reviewed journals that theorize about the relationships um, in networked grassroots activism, including publications in information community and society, um, sorry, information communication and society and the International Journal of Communication. Okay, great. So welcome to all of our panelists. Um, Melissa already mentioned the kind of key housekeeping things, which is A, that this is being recorded. Um, so keep that in mind if you want to ask a question. Um, and B, that we have everybody kind of automatically on mute. So when you when we get to the Q&A, if you want to raise your hand, use the little raise hand emoji thing uh, in the Zoom settings and um, we will keep a cue. Or you can put your question into the chat if you'd prefer to write it out. All right. So I'd like to begin actually by asking each of our panelists to speak for just a few minutes, maybe three to five minutes about your dissertation um, to give the audience kind of some basic background of two things. So first, what is your topic or was your topic in question and how did you come to that topic? How did you come to be interested in it and to pursue it for the dissertation work? And then second, what was the type of research um, or data gathering that you did that you kind of classify under the umbrella of digital ethnography writ large? Um, and I guess I'll go in reverse order from how I introduced. So Yena, let's, let's start with you. To kick us off. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Caitlin. So yeah, so my research dissertation revolves around how content creators are shaping a notion of what a good citizen is in a time and age where a lot of people are coming to platforms, social media to learn about politics and engage in political movement. And so my working answer to that is that uh, content creators are acting as agents for democratic citizenship. So I propose a model of agentic democratic citizenship and introduce three dialogic relationships that constitute that citizenship. And I came to this research interest because I was interested in content creators and because I, I do, used to do research on Twitter where there are a lot of activists, but they don't 
call themselves content creators or not active there don't con create content for people on an everyday basis and I was really interested in the patterns in which these people were creating everyday context for political engagement on platform where people go for entertainment um, mm -hmm. originally so that's um, how I came to this um, dissertation and should, it, should I also talk about the digital ethnography aspect of it Caitlin yes please thank you yeah yeah, so um, it was kind of hard for me to bound my network to begin with because there isn't a single hashtag, specific hashtag for content creators, like, you know, put on their content. So I did start by, like, typing in um, issue hashtags like Stop Cop City and mainly using For You page to increase my network of content creators. And then right now I'm kind of conducting what John Pasta would call dialogic ethnography, looking at um, content creators' pages, the content they produce and have produced to understand the progress and how they approach their content and political um, content. And also what Kristen Hine would say, mobile ethnography, following content, content creators and other platforms where they're active. Great, thank you so much, Yana. Um, now let's move to Zoe, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, this is great. Uh, these are my favorite kinds of events where we get to actually talk about like how people really do these things. Cause as you said, like it really is a lot messier than <laughs> the, the final product. Um, so I finished my PhD in March this year, uh, defended in May, and um, I, well, I started it in 2017, um, and it was a very like long term ethnographic study of um, content creators in the London influence industry um, across a very wide range of genres, uh, as wide as possible. Um, and uh, the project changed a lot throughout, and we'll talk about that later, but um, Basically, in the end, it was about the platformization of creative labor. Um, and I came at that through looking at the, the socio-cultural, technological, and commercial structures that shape the work of creators. And as the project went on, it became like it started, I started out with an interest in, in like precarity, but it kind of morphed into a project about inequality as it went on. Uh, well, both both of those themes, but inequality became a very important theme. Um, so I became interested in how those kind of structures um, result in, in inequalities across intersections of identity. Um, and in terms of the research itself, I did uh, quite a lot of different things. I did, well, there were four main strands of my data collection. I did offline field work at a lot of, um, like industry events like VidCon and Summer in the City in both London and LA, uh, but mostly London, um, where I kind of looked at the industry level, the interactions between creators. Um, I looked at the London Small YouTubers Community Organization, which was like for creators with fewer than 20,000 subscribers, which is small. Um, and I did a lot of online field work where I kind of tried to connect the offline and the online, but like uh, I, I had certain key participants that I followed across platforms. Um, and then I did autoethnography in the form of becoming a YouTuber myself for a year, um, which was interesting. And I can talk more about if you're interested. And I also interviewed 31 creators across a very wide range of um, different factors. So every creator I interviewed was creating a different genre of content um, from like very large genres like gaming and, and lifestyle and beauty to like very niche, uh, you know, sub like there was a, a video essayist that made content about ethnomusicology, which was very like, that's probably the most niche person I spoke to. Um, and I also wanted to get a wide range in terms of like levels of professionalism. So I, I think the smallest person I interviewed was the ethnomusicologist who had one subscriber on YouTube. And I think the biggest had like two and a half million. Um, and then uh, I also, because it was a project about uh, identity, intersectional feminist approach to identity, um, my participants had like represented a wide range of identity categories as well, like race, gender, sexuality. Uh, yeah, that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, so I, yeah, one of the things I want to talk about uh, certainly later is sort of how you triangulated different methods and when to use which one. Um, so, but first, um, let me get to Michelle. So uh, Michelle, take it away. Yeah, hi everybody. Thank you so much to the working group for having me here. This is such an amazing community of scholars. I'm really happy to be here. 
Um, so yeah, my question, what I'm interested in right now, I study QAnon and really it began with um, as an undergrad, I was part of a lot of these meme groups that, I don't know, for whatever reason, they were really popular when I was an undergrad, like specific to each college. Um, there was like a Yale and a Harvard and a UC Berkeley meme group. And at the time I was doing an honors thesis and I didn't know I was doing digital ethnography, but I, I was, I was interviewing people. I was kind of like participating in their groups. I was posting memes myself, kind of like doing some sort of like discourse analysis of the of the memes. My advisors had no idea what I was doing or talking about, but it really began there. And then I started the PhD program at NYU and was still interested in these methods. I came across QAnon, which began in like 2016, 2017. And there's just this group of people who thought like lizards controlled the planet and Donald Trump as a clone lives in space. And I was like, what is going on here? How do people come to believe these things? How do they create community online? Um, I was also really thinking about what it means to participate in politics in this format. Like it is very different than kind of a traditional protesting offline, lobbying, campaigning. Like this is a particular style repertoire set of tactics online. So I'm trying to kind of understand what that means in kind of the modern digital age to participate in politics uh, in that way. And particularly interested in this like gamification of politics, for lack of a better word, like turning um, political events into a sort of like codes and numbers and memes and, and things like that. So that's what I'm interested in. Uh, my methods are, you know, kind of all over the place. There's a lot that I consider to be digital ethnography. I do interviews via Zoom. I do interviews via just kind of like direct messages. I go back and forth with people for years now. Um, I haven't met anybody in person. I do kind of like participant observation and groups. So I just have joined like hundreds of groups and I'll scroll through throughout the day and kind of just see what's going on there. I'll try to participate myself as well. So like I have an account on all these platforms. I've joined all these groups. I comment with my own perspective sometimes. I have like gotten into it with some people who say some crazy things. Like I try to very much immerse myself in these digital worlds um and yeah that's that's what i'm currently up to amazing um thank you all so much i want to open with um kind of a question about research design so how much of the approaches that you three just described was how much of those approaches were the approaches you thought you would be taking embarking on this dissertation project? And how much did things sort of emerge along the way? Like, oh, I actually really need to do like Zoom interviews, right? Or I, I, I'm not sure. I think I need to, you know, get more um, immersion in this or that way. Like if you can talk a little bit about the process of sort of iteration, right? So the research design at the beginning and then where you've ended up and what a, what that kind of narrative of change was like. Um, and then related to that, if you could tell us about a time, if there was one, where you sort of found yourself having to make a compromise, right? So you come across a challenge, um, the, something about the data collection is not going quite as you expected or hoped it would, and you need to pivot, because um, I think most of us encounter those moments um, even far past the dissertation. Um, so yeah, just talking about your experience of kind of iterating, um, pivoting when things don't go as you'd hoped. Um, and I'll, let me get, um, I'll I'll get Zoe Zoe first on that one. Yeah, good questions. I mean, the project my project changed so much from start to finish. So <laughs> there were many moments of pivoting and iteration. Um, as is the way with ethnography, I think that's like the point. Um, so I had a lot of uh, I did a lot of soul searching. I think about like to to at the beginning especially because i felt i was the only person in my cohort at lse that was doing an ethnography um and or at least a long term ethnography and a lot of the other people in my cohort came in with really clear theoretical frameworks questions like their projects were absolutely rock solid from the beginning and they were all brilliant um but i didn't have that because it wasn't it doesn't make sense in an ethnography to have the theoretical framework and the questions all like completely laid out at the beginning um but that was difficult because it was you know i think if you're not in an anthropology department or a department where there's a lot of ethnographers sometimes 
the the flow of the work is different, you know, so that can be challenging. But um, there were many moments I, I mentioned before the um, that point about how my project kind of shifted from being about precarity to being more about inequality. And that was as a result of a particular instance that happened in the first year of my data collection, um, where I, I did some I was doing field work at Summer in the City, which is the, the UK's biggest sort of audience focused um, convention for content creators. And um, one of my main participants was a guy called Taha Khan, who was the platform, um, what was it called? He was like the conference coordinator, or at least, no, he was the panels coordinator. So he was the person who invited creators to come and speak at the conference, um, which was like quite a pivotal role. And um, I did field work at this event, talked to lots of different creators and stuff. And then like a few months later, I was talking to him and he was like, oh, I bet you didn't even realize there was this, all these conversations and problems happening around racial inequality at the event. Um, there were there were a lot of creators who were very unhappy about how they were treated, particularly black creators. Um, they felt that they they couldn't move through the space in the way that the white creators could. And there were there was just a lot of um, there was there were a lot of tensions for those creators who felt that they weren't really welcome at the event. And I did not realize that when I was at the event, I was not part of those conversations and I just had completely missed it. And um, it was just like a really it was a really um, illuminating moment or like an, a humbling moment as well in my field work where you kind of, of course, we all know that our, our research is like situated and you can't capture everything and you, you know, that's okay. But I, I felt like I had kind of failed in that moment to, to gather something that was actually really important. And, um, and that's where I kind of, my project pivoted quite profoundly as a result of that conversation that we had. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were there were so many moments. I think I think especially maybe we'll talk about theory, the connection between theory and method later. But I think a lot of people doing ethnography have a moment where they're like, OK, I've got all this data, but like, what's the theoretical intervention that I'm making? And I really struggled with that as well. And it wasn't until like three years into my project. I did about five years of data collection, three years into the project that I that I just decided that I, it was going to be an intersectional feminist ethnography. And that was such a relief because I was like, oh, thank God I can just, and that was a, as a result of reading some feminist ethnography, you know, um, but I think that sometimes we can feel like we're not meant to put theoretical frameworks onto the work because the data should speak for itself and all this stuff. And I really grappled with that, that question of how, how to come at theory from as an ethnographer. Um, but I'd be interested to hear if other people in the group have had similar issues, because I feel like that was like a huge problem for me until I just decided that that's what I was going to do. I have a quick follow up on that. Um, so when you had that kind of pivotal conversation where you realize like, oh, I've been missing this like big thing that's happening. How did you adjust um, your how did that impact um, not only when you were you know bringing theory in, but also the empirical like data collection that you were doing? How did you adjust based on yeah. that? Pivotal conversation. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, because I, I did, I was doing, I mean, I, I was like midway through my data collection. So I was still selecting interviewees uh, and stuff like that. So it definitely had an impact on the creators that I chose to speak to um, in terms of making like a more conscious effort to have a more diverse array of content creators. I already wanted that going in, but to, to really think about it and actually bring more attention to that in the interviews. Um, and also just in terms of like it, when I went and did in-person field work and when I did online field work, just just paying closer attention to the racial dynamics in particular, but also other questions of inequality, going to certain panels, speaking to different creators and just like just being more attentive to those questions in how I was oriented to the field. Great. Thank you. Um, Yena, do you want to speak to that? that this question about sort of how process changed over time if you had to came to a point where you had a realization maybe similar to Zoe's or if you had to make some kind of compromise things didn't go quite as you'd hoped or intended yeah for sure thank you so much for uh, so much though for talking about the difficulty of balancing theory and what you're finding in the field because I struggle with the same issue I was really interested in the idea of brokerage because I've been working with this idea of brokerage for uh, in previous research um so I was really interested in the interaction that content creators had with their audience so 
more I uh, was on TikTok, I realized that there's not, there's a lot of action, but not much interaction. There's a lot of information, not much data because FYP page, I thought it would be a conversation. There'd be an like, issue that people would converse about. No, people don't, people don't, people don't even really conversation with one another, especially content creators to other content creators, unless you find specific hashtag. And even though content creators would reply to the audience comments and video, it's more so about proving a point than having this conversation. So digital ethnography can be can feel very less generative than in-person ethnography. So this I this idea of capturing tension in how people approach different um, interactions, different people, different actors in different contexts was very, very hard to find for me on FYP page. That's where I first started my field work. So that's when I realized I need to go to different sites. I need to go to different ways that people have conversation. I need to find different actors. So I went to TikTok. I started um, listening into TikTok live stream, which is really where the humanity is at, I think. And I also decided to do a more diachronic uh, approach, which is, I think I may have pronounced this wrong, diachronic, which is where I sort of try to capture the tension in a sort of multi-time approach. Like, so I would look at what content creators created when they first started their account versus what they're doing. Constant conversation with the present. And, and another way was for me to, I think, of course, conduct interviews, right? Um, so all these sort of like, trying to adjust what I knew about ethnography to what is fit for this context when I'm studying, I think that was really important for me. That's such a key point, this this notion of kind of interaction being so central to our traditional understandings of ethnography. And certainly it's happening, right? Um, a lot in digital ethnography, but you sometimes not in the way that you might like initially thought, you know, have thought you would find it. And um yeah, it's it's really, really interesting to hear. It reminds me of one of my field sites for my dissertation. I was in an office at a media company and I was really excited to be to do in-person ethnography and watch these interactions about, you know, what they were gonna write about happen in person in conversation. And I remember the first day in the office, like I walked in and it was silent. Like no one was speaking out loud and everybody had giant headphones on. Um and you know what I realized was, oh, they're interacting all day on IM in Slack, right? Like I need to be in those spaces um, to find where the you know searching for the interaction and it not looking or not being in the place where you thought it might have been. Um, Michelle, I would love to have you speak to this as well. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so my project has evolved a lot, and I think one of the main obstacles, one of the things that I've had to compromise on a lot, is that. So sociology ethnography has always been very much grounded in the offline. So when I would propose research question based on digital world, I would get feedback from faculty, like, so what? Why does this matter? Like, how can we think about how this affects offline things such as voting or um, like what, yeah, what's going on in offline political worlds? And so my original questions were very much about like comparing the online and the offline in terms of QAnon political participation. And I quickly found through like talking to people and interviews and sending them messages that like the offline presence was just not that much of a thing. And they were like, what are you talking about? There's nowhere to go. This is what we're doing this online. And so I was like, oh no. And I felt this kind of tension between what faculty wanted me to do, the questions that they wanted me to ask and what actually was going on with this particular group. So I very much had to pivot to asking more questions directed at digital worlds in and of themselves, which is kind of what I wanted to do in the first place and, and I am doing now. So that I had to, I had to definitely pivot on. Um, the second thing is focusing on any one particular thing online is really, really difficult. I thought I would just go to like the origin of QAnon, which is this site called 4chan, and I would study that platform and that would be that. And they, they're just massive networks that these people participate in. There's MeWe, Parler, 4chan, 8chan, Facebook, Twitter, like I could go on. I have like 30 other platforms that I've been on. So a big difficult, difficulty for me was trying to pick like, where do I spend my time? How do I decide like which interactions are most valuable and most important who do I talk to how do I balance having literally millions of possible people that I could talk to how do I balance having it on my phone on my computer like it being a very much 24 7 thing so yeah just like the narrowing it and the focusing I've had to um, balance and then I guess the third thing 
kind of had to compromise on and it has been difficult is, you know, sociologists, social scientists are very interested in these traditional categories of gender, of race, of location, of age, and that just, we can't really know when we're talking to people online what their background is, where they're coming from, who they are. We can't say with really any definitive sense that like, this is who they are. We can't make sense of their trajectories of the questions that we're interested in, in relation to these categories. And so I've had to try and think of questions and think of arguments and things that I can say without really knowing a lot of what social scientists traditionally care about. And yeah, trying to trying to balance that has definitely been difficult, but I think it opens the doors to totally new questions and new ways of understanding interaction. So that has also been nice. I had just one thing to add to, because I had a similar experience to Michelle with the the, the reason why I left anthropology and went to media and communications was this issue. Like I was, I was in anthropology for my undergraduate and I was really interested in UCL's digital anthropology program, which was next door to SOAS, which was where I did my undergrad. And um, I, and no shade on them. I like the work that they do. They're great. But like they, I emailed them in like 2014, I think, when I was thinking about doing my master's, which would have been like master's and PhD. And I said, like, I'm really interested in what you guys do. I would love to do an online ethnography. Like, I just want to make sure you'd be open to a PhD that was like online only, because at the time, that's what I wanted to do. And they were like, no, <laughs> we don't do that. And I was like, of all the places you would think digital anthropology would be like open to an online only ethnography. Maybe they would be now, but in 2014, they were like really not. Uh, and I find media and communications is a lot more like free for all on methods. So that's why I switched out of anthropology. Yeah, I so I want to kind of coming, to, picking up on this theme, um, uh, but well, there's sort of two themes emerging here. One is like, how do you make your research legible to, um, you know, your committee or, you know, wh whatever it may be. And, um, but I think another theme that I want to just um, piggyback on something that Michelle was talking about a few moments ago is this notion of sort of the difficulty of boundedness, right? So, um, you know, we've all, as people interested in digital ethnography, we know that the field site, um, you know, it probably never has been bounded in quite the way it's sometimes talked about as like, this is the site and it's 30 feet by 60 you know, like it's that doesn't exist really even in sort of physical space. But um, but I think, you know, what was highlighted in what Michelle said is that um, if you're interested in, you know, creator communities or QAnon members or whatever it is like you there, it's not happening in one um website, it's not happening in in like a bounded place. And it's also not happening in, in a bounded time at all. Right. And of course, again, that's true of, uh, you know, an ethnography that happens in um, physical space as well. Um, but I, I think it's, there is some challenge where you could sort of always be collecting data. Like you literally can do it from your, you know, kitchen table um, if you're doing digital ethnography. And so I'm curious how you three have navigated um, making boundaries around your field work, whether from a methodological perspective of, you know, I decided that I was going to bracket it in this or that way, um, from a kind of practical perspective of, you know, I was also TAing and I was also an RA for a faculty member. And I was also like working on a co-authored project with somebody else. And I was also organizing a graduate symposium on whatever, right? And also to maybe trying to even have a life, imagine that. Um, so I'm interested in kind of how you practically navigated this, the potential feeling of boundlessness and the feeling of, I call this like the FOMO question because this feeling of like, this is happening at every moment, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Like how do you sort of think about um, not fixating on all the things you could be missing at the moments where you're where you're not um, collecting data? Um, and then that was a lot of questions, but I'm going to, this is the last one, I swear, related to the topic of FOMO and boundedness. Um, how did you decide when to stop? Um, how did you decide when to kind of be like, okay, I've got enough. And, you know, was that because you felt there was saturation? Was that because you like got a postdoc and you were like, I guess I need to finish so I can <laughs> take my postdoc. Um, so if you could just speak about this notion of boundedness um, with regards to the digital ethnography dissertation. Um, and uh, yeah, now why don't you hop in on that? 
Yeah, this is a very important question. Um, yeah, I don't know where to start because it's a lot. Like, I think what happened for me was definitely like, I think reaching a theoretical saturation that is important because I think when you're doing digital ethnography, it's very easy to fall into checklist mindset. Today, I'm going to um, do hours, n hours of ethnography. I'm going to do, I'm gonna, and this is also like, I think the the blurriness between textual analysis and digital ethnography. Like I'm going to analyze 30 content creators, entire content from the, they started to now. Like that's not that's not possible. That's not doable. That's not sustainable. So I always remind myself, like I'm an ethnographer. I'm here to study culture. I'm not trying to analyze every single thing. I'm not trying to because uh, analyze the content, do con conduct con content analysis by writing down how many followers they have. So I need to really uh, kind of like be in the mindset of like what theoretical situation, how much do I want to achieve when I'm doing digital ethnography um, and not just burden myself with like doing a, making a checklist of everything I did um, that day uh, to make myself proud. And I think also this pressure, I think the digital ethnographers have to observe in data as they're happening and to get it's so that's an important factor in ethnography, but like it's impossible. Like, <laughs> like unless you, um, and our goal as ethnographer is not to um, scrape entire conversation happening around a hashtag right that's not our goal and going back to the theoretical situation I think it's important to kind of capture tension in whatever way we can like um uh how are what are the different actors when when a hashtag is trending how what are the different ways that people are talking about it to different actors what are different contexts like TikTok versus live stream and things like that. So that's kind of how I try to really navigate the burden around doing a boundless uh, research that is in digital ethnography. And also like, I realized that the perfect, the best place to do digital ethnography is airplane because there's no Wi-Fi. Um, so I felt that a lot of times it was just me and my brain, the struggle of me and my brain, because unlike in-person ethnography, we have a pause button. So we can just click the pause and go back to it. But I reminded myself it has to be, it has to feel like an in-person ethnography. So when I'm listening to a podcast, which is my data, I try to listen from beginning to end um, instead of like pausing it. So I think just having that mindset, like I'm, this is happening in real life. This is, I cannot hit a pause button until I'm done with this, until I'm finished consuming this data and then I can go back. <laughs> I love that said it's like trying to sort of create a certain res almost resist the afford some of the affordances of uh, that these digital technologies give us um, in the spirit of trying to like replicate a certain media experience. Um, yeah, Zoe, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, the reality is I'm very bad. I was very bad at bounding my field site. I I see <laughs> my PhDs in my mind is just still ongoing even though i have technically finished it and also it it like ex so it extends forwards and backwards for many years beyond the phd itself which i guess is true for lots of ethnographers but i did my undergraduate dissertation and my master's dissertations about youtube communities so like it, it's all part of that for me um but but in a practical sense um i i had quite a um quite an organized design, which didn't always like reflect the reality of what happened, of course, but like in, you know, because in the first year of my PhD, I had to have like a plan, give a plan to my supervisor of like how I was gonna do data collection. Um, so I had quite a specific plan, which was like in terms of intensive data collection, the intensive data collection was planned to be for two years, um, which was kind of uh, where there was like a stacking process. So like the digital, like the online participant observation was meant to be like the longest chunk. So that that kind of bookended all the other stuff and kind of was, I wanted the project to, to reflect the reality of the digital culture mostly um, because it's tricky when you're combining online and offline to figure out how to weave those two things together. So that was like a real uh, research design challenge for this project. Um, so I did a lot of online, uh, the, the, the kind of, participant observation online before I started doing any of the offline uh, or interview stuff um, because I wanted the especially for the interviews I wanted the topic guide for the interviews to come out of the digital ethnography especially um, which was good and also I found that you know having that in-depth understanding of the culture online really helped me when I when I came face to face with creators and could kind of speak their language you know so to speak um, but the reality is like, I think for me, the challenge was actually like, it's, it wasn't so much about the, 
putting the boundaries around the field but it was more about like I think what Chris Hines talked about which is like um both having so much data that you can collect and also not really having sufficient depth in that data because it's just so dispersed uh and I think especially for me because I had a lot of lot of different types of data collection it felt at times like each piece was really shallow uh, and it didn't, you know, I had to really try hard to to link those things together. So the answer I came to in the end was like what I kind of called, I mean, I don't, this isn't a formal thing, but like what I ended up calling like a participant centered approach, which was like or a key participant centered approach. So I had my my 31 interviewees who were all different creators and I made sure that even though I was interacting with lots of other creators online and offline throughout the research, I made sure to basically watch all of the videos of those 31 people and like observe them across different platforms. I interacted with them multiple times in person as well. Um, so I had that kind of, I could achieve that kind of depth and also try to, to knit together the online and the offline field work in a way that felt satisfying and not like, random you know because I think that can be uh, difficult when you're when you're trying to connect very different disparate spaces um and I mean it was easy to bound the offline field work because it was I just went to certain events uh and I kind of had a I mean COVID happened so I couldn't go to anymore <laughs> which <laughs> really helped um in terms of the online field work I, I didn't bound it at all I literally kept collecting that data until the day I submitted the PhD I actually added a whole example about Substack the day before my deadline, which I wouldn't recommend, but like, you know, I just, I really wanted, I don't know, I just, I probably, as, as a like kind of, to give a sort of numeric answer, I, I probably watched or engaged with creators for at least an hour or more every day of my PhD. So that online, so that kind of, I kept, managed to keep that like sense of an ongoing connection and, and observation, but obviously over time it changed who I was like paying attention to and what genres and stuff. Yeah. I actually think that that hour a day or like at least an hour a day is just like a helpful co concretizing thing. Yeah. <laughs> like Yeah. And to be honest, I mean, it sounds like, I think it, to my supervisor, it sounded like a lot because she's not someone who like watches YouTube or, or TikTok or whatever. But for me, that was what I was doing anyway. So it really was didn't feel like very much work, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I see. Yeah. And I just wrote in the chat hour a day is my, is my mantra. That's, that's really, um, this is so interesting. Um, I love that. So Michelle, um, you mentioned in the previous response, 30 different <laughs> platforms. Um, how on earth did you navigate <laughs> the question of bounds and boundaries? Yeah, I was really overwhelmed at first, uh, trying to like bounce between these 30 different platforms. What I found most useful in trying to pick like where I was going to focus my attention was in interviews. I, one of the first questions I would ask is like, what are your favorite platforms? Where do you spend most of your time? And it turned out after like 10 interviews or so, the same like five-ish platforms came up. So I really just founded it based on what people were telling me and where they were going. And then I kind of created this tracker, which I found to be super helpful for me. It's like a spreadsheet field note tracker where I have the name of the platform, how many hours I've spent there, uh, the date, the times that I've been there. I like link to my field notes so I can kind of see it all laid out. And this is kind of arbitrary, but I'm like, once I get to like 35, 40 hours on each platform, I'll <laughs> be done, which is, again, arbitrary, but putting into some sort of numbers is really helpful. Having the tracker has been really helpful because I can see my progress. I can see, oh, I need to spend five more hours actually on this platform uh, versus this other platform and kind of make sure it's a little bit as, as far as it can be equal. Um, and also in terms of kind of like picking where to focus my energy, I kind of just like went where the links took me. Like I would see a post, click on a link, get sent to another platform. I'd be on that platform, get sent to another one. And just kind of like followed this link footprint, if that makes sense, around until I kind of ended up in pretty much the same four or five platforms, which I now focus on. Um, and then in terms of stopping, I haven't stopped. I'm still going. This is actually a difficult thing for me to decide like, okay, I've done enough. But I think 
when things stop being surprising is kind of what I've told myself when I stop being like, whoa, <laughs> to, to the content that I'm seeing, um, which is hard to do when people think like, Elon Musk has a body double and Hillary Clinton drinks blood. Like I'm perpetually surprised by these things, but um, yeah, I guess that, that feeling of saturation will come when I, I stop seeing things that like, you know, I, I stop seeing things that I hadn't seen that I've seen before or um, yeah, I, I feel like I have answered at least somewhat usefully the questions that I set out to ask, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't stopped. So it's, it's ongoing. Yeah, I think I'm really, um, I'm really, really interested in this kind of notion of um, I, I hear, I'm hearing in these like responses a lot of different ways of kind of bounding um, or just deciding, OK, this is what's going to be like in the tent of this project and this is what isn't. And um, I don't know, I think one thing that's really exciting about like this group coming together, this chat, like so many graduate students working on this is that we this is a collective kind of knowledge, like we're, we're feeling our way toward figuring out um, ways to do this work and, and what works. And so um, it's just really thrilling. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the question and answer after my last question, which is because um, it's really Melissa did like amazing work compiling all the questions so far. Thank you so much. I was like, how am I going to find these in the chat? Um, the last question question though that I want to pose before I turn it over to Q&A is about field notes. So, um, you know, obviously field notes are a really, really central aspect of ethnographic research. There's whole books written about how to write them and different approaches to writing them. Um, one of the challenges that I think occurs, um, or maybe I'll just speak for myself with times I've done, you know, digital ethnographic methods is that um, you can, you know, take a screenshot, right? You can actually um, copy paste an entire verbatim conversation that happened between two people. Um, and so sometimes I think there's there's a question about what is the role of field notes, right? Um, what is the role of field notes? It, it, we can easily imagine if you're in an in-person, like if you're doing field work at a party, um, you know, you have to write stuff down after because you're not going to like creepily videotape everyone at the party. Um, so there was a sort of documentation and that was one of the aspects of field notes, but far from the only one, right? And so I'm interested in how you thought about field notes in your work. Um, how do you, you know, is it documentation? Is it less of that because you're you're relying more on verbatim or screenshots or whatever? Um, is it, you know, are they more interpretive than you expected? Do you even, does it even make sense to make a distinction between, you know, documenting and interpreting and just what is the field note in a digital eth ethnography dissertation and how did you think about that? Um, yeah, any of you just jump in, feel free. I can go first if you yeah, great. want. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And I think it's another example of a thing where like the polished final product or the the, the correct answer is not the same as the actual reality. Um, for me, I, uh, you know, when I went to in person stuff, obviously, I wrote field notes throughout the day. And then I wrote stuff up afterwards. And that was very much just kind of the norm, you know, what you have to do. Um, but when I was collecting stuff online, I would I used I used Envivo to cap capture all of my um, data across like in, in, interview transcripts, field notes, screenshots, um, all all of the different types. Um, uh, if anyone's interested in the like the nitty gritty of that, I have a for the digital ethnography collective. I did a workshop about that in like two thousand and nineteen, which is on our YouTube channel. Um, but um, yeah, with the online stuff, I collected screenshots um, and I didn't write full uh, field notes most of the time, but I would always make sure that I attached a memo to, to the, the screenshot, which explained why, like for what reason I was collecting it, um, which basically like I while I didn't do the full field notes I really wanted to make sure that I engaged on an analytic level when I collected those things so it wasn't just a big pile of stuff that was irrelevant um so I would put a field a memo on it but then I would also code it in the moment um so nothing it in my I had a lot of codes like five six hundred or something but like um in the moment of collecting something I'd always code it uh for like the kind of analytic level. And then I would go, I'd also code it for the name of the person, the date of of the collection and um, 
no, that was it. Name of person, date. And then and then I would code it and and I would go to my codes. Every time I collected something, I went to my codes and I made sure that any like um I can't remember what the name is. It was based on Loftlands. I can I'll look it up and I'll send it out if it's useful. But like basically the the like the small level of the analytic category, which was just kind of descriptive. I would make sure that that went inside a bigger category of analysis. Um, so nothing was just floating around as like a, just a random little like blah. It was like, I've, I've coded it. And then I've also kind of thought on a higher level about the, the thematic analysis. And then periodically I would put even bigger categories, like those second level, second tier categories into third tier categories, which became my like chapters basically in the end and some of them fell away and all that stuff um but yeah i mean i think the nature of the beast is that you do end up collecting this is true of any ethnography but especially i think with digital ethnography there's a risk of collecting so much stuff that you that doesn't end up being used but that's fine it's not really a risk it's just part of the process but i, I would say in the end probably like you know 98 percent of my data didn't make it into my dissertation which is probably like too much. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, but but I think that uh, I will say that the first piece of um, offline field work that I did, which was at the Creators for Change Summit, um, which was a, a YouTube event in 2018, that was, I, I wrote proper field notes for that because it was, it was, I used it as part of the assessment for a methods course on ethnography, um, but it also ended up being field notes for my dissertation. And those were like so nicely written because someone else was reading them and I really made effort to like do them properly. And now those are like the most useful thing I ever did. They're going to be like the introduction to my book. So I would recommend to write full field notes when you can, because they'll be so useful for you when you're actually writing up. But obviously the practicality is like not always that in, in reality. Other panelists want to speak to this question of field notes? Yeah. yeah, like I, yeah, so I, I, the field note that I used to write and the field note now is vastly different, like, um, because as I said, there's so much information. So at first I was just trying to like write down everything, um, including things I thought was interesting or things I just didn't know about TikTok or this content creator. And then right now um, I sort of write my field note more on just focus on more on the theoretical frameworks I already have laid out and then I link the TikTok video um I filled notes so I think um it's really important for digital ethnography to be very diligent about um analyzing coding from the very beginning so you can find that focus that you want to really uh, delve into because as I mentioned there's so much information and turning that into data is the key I use Workflow and Notion. I used to use Notion, but Notion, I, I got really preoccupied how pretty everything looked. So I just worked with Workflow now. <laughs> um, yeah, I can share on this as well. One thing I really love about Field Notes of Digital Ethnography is that it's so concurrent. I don't have to like after the fact reflect on or interpret what was happening. I have like two screens and on one screen I'll have the social media platform. The other screen I'll have my notes. And then I like to separate the notes that I'm taking into like my interpretation or analysis versus the just like the who, what, where, when, why question. So I'm making sure that I'm separating like my understanding of what's going on versus like this is exactly what's going on. Um, and another great thing about digital ethnographic methods is that I have the data as it is. Like I'm not having to like make anything up or interpret anything. I just have the exact post. I have the exact video. I have the exact whatever it is. And it feels really like truthful to what's going on in these spaces. Um, and then of course that comes with like its own ethical dilemmas of like, what can I share with people? Because things that become searchable, Googleable, et cetera. So yeah, ethical, ethical issues are definitely there, but the data itself, I feel like has higher integrity than if I was just like an hour later, like kind of coming up with what was going on or interpreting what was going on. Um, and it's also just really nice to be able to record my reactions and my emotions in real time to what's happening and really like fully immerse myself in that. Um, and then I'll, I'll say last is just, I, I like to keep different kinds of data in different places. So I have like my field notes for just scrolling through in one place. I also do like these screen share interviews where I'll ask someone to like, actually I'll see their screen and they'll like walk me through the different 
platforms that they're on. So I'll have like my field notes for that in a different place. And then I have like these like DM interviews where I'm just kind of messaging back and forth with people. I have my notes for that in a different place. So I'm making sure that I'm keeping different kinds of data in different places and understanding my reactions and the interactions that are happening there in different ways and kind of being able to put them together at the end, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. There have been some questions in the chat about how to kind of, considering that a lot of digital ethnographic projects kind of have mixed mixed methods or just like mixed modes of data. Um, this is this is super helpful to hear kind of practically how people th organize this. Um, okay, I'm gonna kind of open it up to Q and A. We've already had an incredibly uh, energetic chat where people are sharing resources, and it's really um, wonderful to see. I'm, there's so many questions that have been asked um, in the doc, even in the document Melissa put together, and now it, like there's more. So I'm gonna try to synthesize like a couple of the themes because we have about 30 minutes left um, to try to get to you know as many of the questions as I can. So um, a lot of folks are raising, and and Michelle, you kind of segue into this uh, questions about ethics um, and relatedly maybe questions about and this might be kind of um, you know definitely as relevant for Michelle's work and, and I would love to hear the other two as well about safety right so um, so in terms of I guess I'll first ask um, the ethics one so folks have asked questions about IRB right how do you kind of navigate um, IRB applications for this kind of research um, given that, you know, IRBs sometimes, uh, like, sometimes it feels like when we do just in-person in ethnography, it's like not what they're set up to deal with. Uh, digital ethnography is obviously even more recently developed method. Um, and how did you um, deal with, you know, in terms of your own thinking about ethics, like, uh, you know, presenting yourself in these spaces, um, but also um, things like assigning pseudonyms and stuff like that, the kind of nitty gritty of navigating um, the ethics of this research. Michelle, yeah, you're unmuted. You can go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I can start with that because I think a lot about the ethics of these things. Um, first, which the IRB is not great with these things. I, I don't, just don't think they're equipped to understand the differences involved in the digital ethnography versus an offline ethnography. So they ask questions about like, is this group public? Is this group private? Which is really difficult to ascertain online. Like there's this kind of like spectrum or continuum continuum of publicness and privacy, which is really, it's hard to kind of like set a, a boundary with that. So I've had to think about um, what it means to be on public view or not, if the, the people that I'm talking to want their posts to be shared or not, et cetera. So navigating that has been difficult. And I've kind of just tried to like ask people one-on-one -on -one. if I know I want to use a particular post or video, et cetera, I'll be like, I'm really interested in this thing you said. This is potentially where it could go. I'm thinking about, you know, writing a journal article. This I'll be very explicit about it being part of my dissertation, although I can't, you know, anticipate exactly what the risk to them could possibly be. I try to be as like open and upfront about that as possible. Um, and then in terms of like, do I use my own name? Do I use pseudonyms for them? I use my real name and real photo, which is maybe a crazy thing to do, but I just feel like I kind of owe them that like I don't want to be this like lurking ethnographer I want them to know that I'm a researcher like I put in my bio that I'm a researcher I tell them up front when I'm talking to them that I'm a researcher I want it to be very clear what I'm doing so it's not this kind of like more extractive experience um and then I find that actually being open up front about what I'm doing leads them to be a little bit more honest with me sometimes like they're even for people that are like these like far right extremists who are very skeptical of academia are like, wow, thanks for like telling me. And then they, yeah, we can have more open and honest conversations. So yeah, I do tend to use my real name. I think that it depends on the, the communities that you're studying and it depends on who you are. And yeah, safety is a, a difficult thing to, to balance online. But yeah, I think part of it for me has been trying to be at least as open as I as I possibly can be with my participants. Anyone else want to jump in on the question of IRB and ethics stuff? Yana? I mean, Michelle, like I, I don't know how you study um, right wing active because I wanted to, but I was like, um, maybe when I'm done with this project, I will have more courage. 
But I, I think, yeah, IRB is just a hassle, right? Um, I think it's just very important to, like for me, like one thing that I really want to start implementing is kind of have this relationship with the content creators, especially because they're, you know, most of them are, um, you know, marginalized individuals really putting themselves uh, out there uh, despite the risk to, you know, talk about their, you know, talk about social justice issues. And there's so much hate that they receive on an everyday basis. And I do want to do something more than just like, you know, giving the content creators like $25 gift card, right? So like, I think it's always important to kind of think, be thinking about how I can be of help of assistance um, in ways that are just not monetary, just not te uh, just temporary. Um, and so, I mean, I, we're, I'm part of a lab called um, Digital Apothecary Lab started by Professor Moy Bailey in my, in my school. And we are, we definitely, um, and some couple of us are working on a paper on like challenges that content creators face with accessibility. So like maybe having a chapter on like the practical sort of, um, challenges the content creators face and how can academic community as a whole can provide like design solutions or things like that for these critical issues I think could be one way we could be of um, support as academics. Yeah I have a couple of things I to totally agree with the general vibe which is like don't be a dick you know <laughs> if people like you, you want people you don't you don't want to be extractive right um and it, it varies a lot depending on who you're studying but for me um my kind of um well ethics bible which probably lots of people use is the air ethics guidelines the air being the association of internet researchers i think they're on their third iteration now they're working on the fourth a uh, really useful document for anyone who's trying like grappling with online ethics um and i think like the main thing i took away from that document is um to go beyond like platform terms and conditions like you're not it's not about just like oh well they said I couldn't do this and I and sometimes it's actually it it's subverting platform terms and conditions as well sometimes I mean the terms and conditions are really just to protect the platform not not it's not got anything to do with researchers in a lot of ways um but yeah for me um one of the reasons why I wanted to interview people aside from it just being useful to interview people is that when I interviewed people, they um, signed consent forms for me to firstly use their names, like their real names, and secondly, to correlate their um, name their, and their interview transcript with their online activity. Um, and I said to people, you know, I explained what that was about. And I said, of course, you could be anonymized or I don't have to talk about your online content if you would rather I didn't. But no one that I interviewed had a pro problem with it, which was very helpful um, and it meant that I could I I could really feel comfortable that I wasn't kind of exploiting people um, and I also practiced like ongoing consent so when I wrote something I would often or usually especially if it was sensitive I would send it back to the creator for to read and to to tell me if they were unhappy with anything I'd written or if I had mis misinterpreted anything they had said um, and and they they no one ever told me they were unhappy with it. Sometimes they added clarifications or extra details, which which was really helpful. Um, it is a bit stressful asking that though because it's like it feel, feels vulnerable, like sh sharing, you know. And and it depends who you're speaking about and whether it's appropriate to share your your like final product with your participants. But in my case, it it was. Um, so that was great. But like, I mean. For me, part of the, that ethics design and research design was based on the fact that I was trying to really inhabit that kind of like I, the the role of a creator, so, which is why I became a creator and also why I tried to interact with creators in that way, you know, trying to kind of create some kind of um, like lack of hierarchy. I know that's like problematic because of course there's going to be a hierarchy and it's not like we're the same but, you know, trying to actively build that into the research design in every way that I could. Thank you. Yeah. I So there's another very lively conversation going on and a, a couple of questions about um, some uh, students or researchers using discourse analysis or critical discourse analysis, some uh, content analysis, right? And some mentioning that they have gotten a pushback, like, 
isn't this just content analysis, right? Like, how, like, so, you know, how do you think about the distinction between methods of discourse analysis and methods of digital ethnography and the dissertation research? How do you um, frame that for potentially um, the, you know, the grumpy skeptical <laughs> reviewer uh, that you have to deal with? I can say something to that. Um, I think that the reality is a lot muddier than we would like to believe. But like, of course, when you're doing online stuff, it depending on what you're looking at. But if you're looking at like people who create content, then of course, you're going to be looking at some content. But the way that I understand it is like, there's a difference between analyzing content and looking at action, you know, pra practice, cultural practices. So like when I'm looking at uh, uh, content, like a YouTuber's channel or something i'm not just watching the video and analyzing the video i'm also looking at the comments and how they interact over time with their audiences and how the audiences interact with each other and how those creators also exist across other platforms so it's it's much more dispersed and kind of bigger sort of project than not bigger in any kind of like i'm not making a distinction between like one being better than the other but it's a just a different type of practice but i think that a lot of the time content analysis can also be part of a digital ethnographic project I think usually it is and it could be critical discourse analysis if your theoretical framework is is a critical framework it probably will be some kind of critical discourse analysis I think that's what I would say would anyone disagree with that yeah like I recently uh, watched John Postel's was part of John Postel's uh, Oxford seminar where he was a very strong advocate of flat methodology like digital ethnography doesn't have to complement anything it can be on its own and and it, you don't have to constantly think about if it's an ethnography and like that was very you know a relief coming from uh, a scholar to like um, John Postel so I I do agree like what works works and I I do think that we need to sort of um like do uh, do what works and works and like really dig deeper into the networks and really try to find as much you know data among the information as you can go to pod listen to people's podcasts go to live streams but when it comes to sort of like differentiating the different terminologies yes I think that critical discourse analysis and um, content analysis can be part of the ethnographic project Right. But I think that part of what makes ethnography ethnography is that you we are really interested in the what Zoe emphasized culture, right? The cultural context, really understanding the the context of what is happening. And so of course there's an a term called archival ethnography. You know, like so it's a kind of sort of similar baseline here. And so I think it's always important to sort of understand that ethnography is not just like analyzing, comparing, um, what people said about understanding the interaction the, of the culture of it all. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you. I think these labels that are like, that kind of started in studies of offline worlds applied to online worlds just make a little bit less sense, um, especially when you have so many different kinds of content, right? You have videos, you have text, you have memes, you have links, you have so many different kinds of things going on. So to say like, oh, when I'm looking at text, this is discourse analysis, but when I'm looking at a video, this is this. And when I'm looking at a meme, it's this. Just, I, I think those boundaries just are less applicable to these online worlds. So I honestly tried to like avoid saying I'm doing any one particular thing at all. It's just kind of been my way of, of balancing that. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really helpful. Um, and and sometimes it's like, you know, we can we can also point to each other's work as like this is how this person did it, right? Like that can that's a really important sort of way of building, um, you know, a, a, like a critical mass for legitimacy, um, or making our methods legible in academia. Um, I want to ask um, a couple of topics that have come up in the Q and A that have not that I have not asked about yet. Um, so one of them is about the writing process, um, which is uh, comp is hard. <laughs> I can't think of a more eloquent way than to say writing is hard. Um, writing when you have so much data and you even when you coded it right like it is just really challenging um so i'm interested to hear you speak about what the writing process is like if you're in the midst of it or was like or maybe what the process of transforming it into a book in zoe's case um what it's like and specifically somebody asked a question about um kind of making 
one of the things that those of us who love reading ethnography love is like the the richness, right? The scene setting, the kind of um, the depth of of like what is conveyed, the vividness. And how did you sort of approach, um, or how do you think about sort of creating that when you know much of the data is not you know is is online? Um, but anything you really want to say about your writing process, I think would probably be really helpful to this audience. So I'll, I'll also leave it pretty open. Um, yeah. Yeah. Zoe, go ahead. I was just going to say someone else can go first if they want to. I could also go first. I don't mind. Well, we're, first. I'm, I'm at the writing yeah. stage, so I feel Zoe, you, 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 <laughs> um, you got <laughs> I mean, so I have a, I think a comforting answer for the people currently working on dissertations, which is we all want it to read beautifully and to do all the thick description and really put the reader in the moment and all that stuff. But it's really hard and it takes loads of time to do that. And okay, you other guys here might disagree, but in order to pass a PhD, you don't necessarily need to do all of that. Um, obviously it's nice if you can, but for me, I'm trying I, I basically ran out of time, um, you know, partly because I had a baby and then I was very much struggling to finish the PhD on time. Um, but I ended up um, leaning very heavily on my interview transcripts, which wasn't what I wanted to do. But it was just so much easier to make the arguments I wanted to make with quotes like, boom, there you go. There's the data. Like someone said it, you know, um, even though it would have been so much nicer to like really paint the scene and 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 have those arguments made from the field work from especially from the offline and the online field work. Um, and it was fine. You know, the examiners did not care in the end. But in the process of of writing the book, I really want to like bring that stuff forward because it's it's what's so fun. It's like why we love ethnography is like reading ethnographies is such a joy when they're like written really well and it really puts you in the place and makes you understand the culture. Um, but like, don't stress too much about it if you're working on a, a PhD now and you don't have time or you are struggling to like really get that that thick description in um that's what i think i don't know um i i have uh kind of a suggestion when it comes to like writing about digital ethnographies which came to me when i went to this conference at yale called mixed realities and there were several students whose dissertations were like multimedia um and for some of them like their committees really didn't like that they were including other things besides writing but i think what is great about digital ethnography is like you have all of this kind of like immersive data and that's the extent to which you can include that as part of the dissertation itself like it doesn't just have to be me writing chapters but I could also like show you a video that I'm talking about hopefully or show you the images show you the memes like show you the links that that I'm kind of analyzing and kind of like put you in the moment there by doing that so like the extent to which I can include things other than text I think will ultimately like make for a better dissertation, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's such a key point too, is that um, we, we needn't be in a kind of like a defensive posture of being like, I know I wasn't in person with people, but my research is still valuable. Like it's like, there's actually things that are an asset, right? There, there, there's like ways to add texture that maybe don't exist if you're only using in-person data. Um, I think it's really important to like, to trumpet those. Um, Yana, do you have thoughts on this? Honestly, as a person still writing, like this is great. Um, I was actually kind of thinking about that, like, because um, I heard that when you, when, when, when people, when we are publishing this into a book, when you get to the stage, it's very hard to include images that are not our own. So, so I don't, I don't know if you've had a, a, a sort of issue with that because I know you're in a publishing stage like screenshots or, or anything, images that, that you didn't create? Did you have any issue? I, some, I mean, Caitlin and Jeff and Melissa might know more about this. I haven't, I never, in my PhD, I didn't include any screenshots. I used photos that I took during offline field work, but I never actually used screenshots in the thesis because I wasn't sure even in the thesis about doing that. But do you know on a practical level, if you're allowed to use screenshots? 
Um, I, I use screenshots and in, in something that I recently published, um, but that was with a particular journal. So I'm not sure if that varies by, by journal or not. Certainly in my case, I think I, in my book, I did have a screenshot of a tweet and Twitter, well, who knows now? I mean, it was like still Twitter, you know, all they flew out the window, but they did have a lot of stipulations at the time about how the logo would look like that's the main thing is, um, and they, I think they wanted it like in color, which was the book was, had no images and, you know, um, but you can apply for a special permission and, um, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's hopefully like people at the press <laughs> that will, that will kind of help you navigate that. Um, and, and also again, like all bets are off with that particular platform. Um, but also I think some presses say, you know, images are more expensive. They have limits on kind of the number of images that they want, or they might say you need to to pay for you know images above a certain amount, a certain number. Um, so just something to to be thinking about. Um, okay, um, I'm going to. Oh, Melissa flagged another question in the chat. Okay, um, interested in how you reach out to your participants for interviews. Yeah, so we haven't talked about access yet. Um, so let's talk about that for a minute, right? How, how did you kind of get um, into these communities? Um, how did you reach out, like? So it literally like what did you prompt people with I think like the more granular the better um the more concrete the better because it always feels um or at least speaking for myself quite daunting to kind of like cold reach out to someone um so yeah what were your prompts did you oh somebody says they can only reach out to the the creator in like comments of a video right like so how do you get these prompts or these requests seen by the person and how do you phrase them um what is that process of access like yeah i can i can speak sorry i'm so bad i feel like i always answer questions first when i always fill a gap if some people stop talking does anyone else want to speak first <laughs> okay Take great um, yeah. Yeah, yeah access was probably like one of the biggest challenges of my project because i really wanted to like i really felt that for it to be a sort of satisfying and complete ethnography of the influencer industry, which is what I was doing. I needed to talk to some, at least some big creators, but like we all know, they're really hard to get access to. So it's probably the biggest question I get from people who are doing dissertations or projects where they're, they're studying influencers is like, how did you get access? Cause some of my, the creators I interviewed were quite like pretty famous um but it took a really really long time and a lot of effort to get access to those people and it wasn't online so if you're doing an online only ethnography uh, you might get access to those people but it's probably fairly unlikely um or at least it was in my experience um I because I tried to get access to some people before I started the offline field work and got like just hit a complete wall sometimes I would get replies from their agents if they were big creators um being like no thanks <laughs> and I'd just be like okay um but when I started I mean partly it was luck and then you know tenacity I guess like all ethnography um but the fir that first field work I did which was the creators for change summit um I, I was really really lucky to get access to that event and that was really because it was a YouTube event and that was really just because my supervisor Sonia Livingston was invited and she didn't want to go um so she was like do you want to go and I was like yeah <laughs> hell yeah and that was in the like three months into my PhD so I was not ready really to like start you know the field work but I just went um and when I was there I immediately spotted like six creators that I had wanted to meet and like speak to people who I'd watched for like 10 years at that point um and I kind of sat next to one of them and like made small talk with him and um, he turned out, he's now my friend, Jazza. He turned out to like, it was just very lucky. It, this is how it is with ethnography. Like you just have to try and talk to people and see what happens. And just, if you see an opening, just like, just go for it, you know? Um, but that's if you're doing in person, the in-person stuff. So anyway, it turned out that he was doing a master's at the Oxford Internet Institute. So he was really interested in what I was doing. He also knew all of the creators in the UK scene because he was like one of a real like OG creator, even though he was a small creator at the time. Um, so he introduced me to a lot of people. He brought me as a plus one to the green rooms at events. So I got to be in those really elite kind of 
exclusive spaces and then I was able to meet other creators and and so on and so forth but like I think having that uh, what's the word when you have like one person who's your kind of in there's a like an ethnography word for that I can't remember what it is but um and it's a sponsor is that right Jeff? yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) he was like him and Taha they I met them both at that first event and they were like my greatest sponsors like they were just I was so lucky that I met them there um and that we had things in common that we were interested in and yeah they introduced me to a lot of people and and even then people they introduced me to I had to meet them some of them two or three or four times before they agreed to be interviewed because they were like who the fuck are you like just some (laughs) researcher like hanging out in their space you know so um yeah it took a lot of effort but I mean also I would say that if you're studying content creators at the beginning of my project I wanted to only look at professional creators so people who were doing it full time and I'm really glad that my supervisor said why you know why do you only want to look at big full-time creators like wouldn't you learn something interesting from speaking to small creators or creators who are struggling to make it and that was the best piece of advice because a lot of the most useful data I got was from talking to small creators who were not doing well like by any technical measure um they had like the best insights about the barriers to entry in the industry so it's okay you know you might just have to change your questions a bit if you if you're planning to talk to huge creators and you can't access them it doesn't mean that it won't be a super interesting project if you just switch gears a bit and talk to different creators small creators are a lot easier to get access to obviously you can probably just send them a message on twitter and they'll be like cool great you know yeah, definitely small creators, um, way, way easier. And I also was on, I also try to purchase some patrons um, to, to subscribe. Also, yeah, I'm I'm still conducting interviews, so it's a struggle, but I definitely agree with the, um, the uh, don't just reach for people with like millions of followers, um, because I think that actually like the smaller creators have a lot more, like I think, um, a lot more than what they want to share about the current struggles that they're facing, balancing their work and also part-time work. They started as content creators. So I definitely, yeah, agree with that point. Um, Yeah, access has been particularly tough for me given I study in extremist communities. So half the time I have people saying just like really mean things to me, which I'm kind of like very jaded about at this point that's made it difficult but basically every single day I'll send a recruitment message like to get to a satisfactory number of people to talk to in interviews I'll send a dm or a or I'll post in a particular group almost every day so I've, at this point I've sent like hundreds and hundreds of messages hoping for some replies and it and it works and then another thing I've done for access is just really trying to develop more like ongoing consistent relationships with people via direct messages And I kind of like knew that I had access. I knew I was in when I had like posted in this other group on a platform and someone immediately commented like, go away. And then this guy who I developed this relationship with was like, no, she's cool. She's doing really great research. Don't worry about it. So I felt like because I had developed a closer, more ongoing relationship with someone and they like defended me in that space. I was like, okay, yeah, I have finally gotten in. I finally have access. So I, I really think it's a lot about like persistence relationship building and and honesty and transparency these are such great responses um so we have three minutes left i'm gonna use moderator privilege and ask a final question which is um if you could kind of travel back in time and speak to yourself at the start of this process, what piece of advice would you give previous you um, slash what advice would you give to um, PhD students who are maybe embarking on a project or or in the earlier stages in the middle of it? Um, Michelle, do you want to start since you're, oh, you are not unmuted anymore, but you can jump in. <laughs> you sure. Can start off. sure, yeah. First is just that the amount methods are legitimate they're important they're great and just reminding myself and other people that what they're doing it's not any less important or interesting than offline work so that's definitely a number one two is that there are so many different ways to do digital ethnography like I we have our, our own kind of digital ethnography workshop and there's someone who's doing virtual reality and so she's kind of like taking us into these virtual worlds that's just like another method I hadn't even considered so just, yeah, the diversity of methods is, is really important to think about. And then 
third, and this might be particular to my community, is that like ghosting, rejection, people, harassment even are kind of part of the process and to be aware of that and to understand that like not everything is going to be easy, not everyone's going to be friendly and not everyone's going to answer you and you might have to deal with some particularly difficult things at times but that yeah that is that is part of the process unfortunately so yeah that, that would be my my three takeaways uh i'm 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 still t t thinking but like having this um participating in events like this i think uh it's super helpful i wish i attended more events in digital ethnography where people talked about digital ethnography i think it, since the pandemic there has been a lot more interest in digital ethno ethnography so yeah like maybe creating a network of people who's doing digital ethnography and 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 sharing your work early on to be really honest i think that is like what i would start what i would do um, what, what, I, what I would have done when I started out my project sharing like my thoughts my concerns like just idea of having too much information on my hand with people who understand digital ethnography that is very important because you know uh, who you see every day at school your department people in your department may not really understand what digital ethnography is so I think really finding a group of people that you can share these concerns I think are super helpful and, and don't be frustrated <laughs> like like <laughs> If there, the theoretical imagination will come to you and when it when it does like be flexible and it's okay if you have to recollect data it's fine maybe uh you'll uh, we will be out of time short of time but things will work out yes so we go ahead yeah that's all that's so nice i like all of this advice um i before i give my advice i would just feel that i should share just in case anyone here has not seen it before we have a big old reading list that may be useful to you um it's huge now i think it's like 34 pages long on digital ethnography that you might find useful um two things and they're kind of contradictory so forgive me um but firstly i kind of wish that at the beginning someone had told me who someone who was an ethnographer had told me it was fine to just like have a theoretical position or a political position and to just stick with it like that's okay because I think at the beginning I was so I was so caught up with this kind of purist idea like kind of that comes from anthropology I think of like this completely emergent grounded theory and that's great like that's also awesome but it's also okay to like come in with a position um and and if I had known that from the beginning, it would have been so much easier for me to get to the, the final piece. Like I really agonized about that, putting kind of, I felt like I was like putting a theoretical framework on top of my data. And actually it wasn't that at all. It really worked with the data. Um, so that's okay. Um, but also uh, this is the contradictory part. I would say like trust the process and just like let it unfold because at the beginning you won't know what the project is or what where it's going to end up and that's kind of the beauty of ethnography like it takes you on a journey and it's supposed to so so even if for the first year or whatever of data collection depending on how much time you have you feel completely lost and like you're just bumping around in the dark like it will it, you will come out with so much richness of of data and like that data will also carry you way beyond the PhD because you'll have so many projects or articles that you can write afterwards that you weren't able to put in the dissertation which is like a real blessing when you get into the kind of postdoc or you know uh, assistant professor phase <laughs> and you don't have as much time for data collection. Wonderful. All right. Well, please join me in thanking our fabulous panelists for being so generous with their brilliant minds and their stories and their experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a, an avalanche of appreciation in the chat. Um, I hope you're looking at the comments. Um, Melissa also uh, took the chat and uh, uh, pasted it into the chat. So um, there have been a lot of amazing resources being shared, folks forming smaller communities with each other over email. It's really inspiring to see. So please grab that if you'd like to. And of course, as always, the recording of this event will be posted on our YouTube channel um, and uh, maybe on the, on the Digital Ethnography Collective YouTube channel. So you can find it either of those places. Thank you all again so much and uh, look forward to seeing um, you at future events and good luck with your digital ethnography projects. Thanks a million. Bye. Guys. Bye.